and 2001, Canadian astronomer Ken Tapping, together with two British Columbia physicians, were the latest scientists to confirm, yet again, that for at least the last three centuries, influenza pandemics have been most likely to occur during peaks of solar magnetic activity that is, at the height of each 11 sun cycle. Such a trend is not the only aspect of this disease that has long puzzled virologists. In 1992, one of the world's authorities on the epidemiology of influenza, R. Edgar Hope Simpson, published a book in which he reviewed the essential known facts and pointed out that they did not support a mode of transmission by direct human-to-human -human contact. Hope Simpson had been perplexed by influenza for a long time, in fact, ever since he had treated its victims as a young general practitioner in Dorset, England, during the 1932-1933 epidemic the very epidemic, during which the virus that is associated with the disease in humans was first isolated. But during his 71-year career Hope Simpson's questions were never answered. The sudden explosion of information about the nature of the virus and its antigenic reactions in the human host, he wrote in 1992, had only added to the features calling for explanation. Why is influenza seasonal, he still wondered. Why is influenza almost completely absent except during the few weeks or months of an epidemic? Why do flu epidemics end? Why don't out-of-season epidemics spread? How do epidemics explode over whole countries at once and disappear just as miraculously as if suddenly prohibited? He could not figure out how a virus could possibly behave like this. Why does flu so often target young adults and spare infants and the elderly? How is it possible that flu epidemics traveled at the same blinding speed in past centuries as they do today? How does the virus accomplish its so-called vanishing trick? This refers to the fact that when a new strain of the virus appears, the old strain has vanished completely all over the world at once. He listed 21 separate facts about influenza that seemed to defy explanation if one assumed that it was spread by direct contact. He finally revived a theory that was first put forward by Richard Shope, the researcher who isolated the first flu virus in pigs in 1931 and who also did not believe that the explosive nature of many outbreaks could be explained by direct contagion. Shope proposed that the flu is not in fact spread from person to person in the normal way, but that it instead remains latent in human or swine carriers who are scattered in large numbers throughout their communities until the virus is reactivated by an environmental trigger of some sort. Hope Simpson further proposed that the trigger is connected to seasonal variations in solar radiation and that it may be electromagnetic in nature, as a good many of his predecessors during the previous two centuries had suggested. When Hope Simpson was young and beginning his practice in Dorset, a Danish physician named Johannes Miggy, at the end of a long and distinguished career, had just published a monograph in which he too showed that influenza pandemics tended to occur during years of maximum solar activity, and further that the yearly number of cases of flu in Denmark rose and fell with the number of sunspots. In an era in which epidemiology was becoming nothing more than a search for microbes, Miggy admitted, and knew already from hard experience, that he who dances out of line risks having his feet stomped on. But he was certain that influenza had something to do with electricity, and he had come to this conviction from personal experience. In 1904 and 1905, Miggy had kept a careful diary of his health for nine months, and he later compared it to records of the electrical potential of the atmosphere, which he had recorded three times a day for ten years as part of another project. It turned out that his incapacitating migraine-like headaches, which he had always known were connected to changes in the weather, almost always fell on the day of, or one day before, a sudden severe rise or drop in the value of the atmospheric voltage. But headaches were not the only effects. On the days of such electrical turmoil, almost without exception, his sleep was broken and unrestful, and he was bothered with dizziness, irritable mood, a feeling of confusion, buzzing sensations in his head, pressure in his chest, and an irregular heartbeat, and sometimes, he wrote, my condition had the character of a threatening influenza attack, which in every case was not essentially different from the onset of an actual attack of that illness. In 1836, Heinrich Schweik observed that all physiological processes produce electricity and proposed that an electrical disturbance of the atmosphere may prevent the body from discharging it. He repeated the then common belief that the accumulation of electricity within the body causes the symptoms of influenza. No one has yet disproven this. It is of interest that between 1645 and 1715, a period astronomers call the Maunder Minimum, when the sun was so quiet that virtually no sunspots were to be seen and no auroras graced polar nights during which, according to native Canadian tradition, the people were deserted by the lights from the sky, there were also no worldwide pandemics of flu. In 1715, sunspots reappeared suddenly after a lifetime's absence. In 1716, the famous English astronomer Sir Edmund Halley, at 60 years of age, published a dramatic description of the Northern Lights. It was the first time he had ever seen them. But the sun was still not fully active. 
As though it had woken up after a long sleep, it stretched its legs, yawned, and lay down again, after displaying only half the number of sunspots that it shows us today at the peak of each 11-year solar cycle. It wasn't until 1727 that the sunspot number surpassed 100 for the first time in over a century. And in 1728 influenza arrived in waves over the surface of the earth, the first flu pandemic in almost 150 years. More universal and enduring than any in previously recorded history, that epidemic appeared on every continent, became more violent in 1732, and by some reports lasted until 1738, the peak of the next solar cycle. John Huxham, who practiced medicine in Plymouth, England, wrote in 1733 that scarce anyone had escaped it. He added that there was a madness among dogs, the horses were seized with the catter before mankind, and a gentleman averred to me that some birds, particularly the sparrows, left the place where he was during the sickness. An observer in Edinburgh reported that some people had fevers for 60 continuous days and that others, not sick, died suddenly. By one estimate, some 2 million people worldwide perished in that pandemic.